So in my experience, it's not uncommon for someone who is um, serving God, who is living their Christian faith, to get or to feel like they're stuck. And you may recognize this kind of sensation. Uh, in fact, this might be a great question. How many of you have ever prayed? Think back, think back on when you were young. Some of you, it's like last week. And you remember praying, God, I shouldn't feel that way. Take it away. You remember that prayer? I shouldn't want that. I shouldn't need that. I shouldn't like him. I shouldn't desire him or her. Would you take that feeling or that desire away? Let me see your hands. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? And we're like desperately depending on God to zap us in the moment with life change, right? And I come from a faith tradition like many of you where having a moment, having an experience, or hearing somebody say, I was addicted to drugs and cigarettes for 30 years, and then in one moment I prayed, and then God delivered me. And then the rest of us are like, when, when, when is that going to happen to me? I can't stop eating hostess ho-hos. Please, God. Or whatever other vice. And we know God can intervene and zap us with deliverance, don't we? It's the way God works. He can heal us. He can deliver us. But for most of us, we find ourselves sometimes stuck needing life change, and the life change doesn't come. And there's a lot of reasons we get stuck. But today, we're going to look at how Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that God provides the power to exchange our old life with a new one. You don't even need the receipt. You just... You just show up in God's life, and you show up in God's uh, design. You show up in uh, God's family, and He starts to work and help us to um, swap that out. And so I've come uh, across these experiences of my own, and I wonder if you've come across them too, of just feeling stuck in the old way of life, stuck in doing things the way I've always done them, stuck in desiring the things I've always desired. In fact, a lot of times when you ask people, how is, how is it going, they already know how it's going, and they tell you it's going same old, same old. Nothing's changing. It's all the same. And of course, they mean their circumstances, but I feel like it could also be a good answer when you say to somebody, how are you changing? Same old, same old. I'm stuck. Very little happening. And what we learn is we learn new ways of managing our pain. We learn, learn new ways of managing our boredom. We learn new ways of managing the monotony or the disappointments in our lives, sometimes finding new ways to manage the hurts, the habits, and the hang-ups that we've always had. Well, good news, God has provided the power to exchange that old life for a new one. And no matter where you are in your life, for some people, it's a lot of time and energy trying to protect the secrets of our lives. For others, it's trying to get past and get over the slip-ups that we've made in our life, the bad decisions that have cost us some of our emotional, physical, mental health, spiritual health. Perhaps it's uh, some of the scandals that has happened in your life, scandalous things that have happened to you by people that you loved or trusted and you're stuck, overcome with some of the pain that's caused by those scandals. And so many people with deep, life-altering scars, mistakes that have made, decisions that have been made, pains and um, hurts that have continued to fester, and those scars are beginning to grow over, but there's still a very, very intense memory that has disrupted your life. And so now most of your life is coming to terms with this problem that your past really happened and that pain is real. Grief, emptiness, loneliness, betrayal, disappointment, hardship, all the stuff that goes on. Maybe even a sense of failure related to other people that I care about. My past experiences have left me feeling dented and damaged. My past experiences have left me feeling defeated. And if that's you today, 
If your past decisions, your past experiences have hurt your future, I want you to ask, this, ask yourself this question, if you wouldn't mind. I'm going to ask you this question. Would you be willing to ask your, yourself this question? Is it always going to be this way? Am I always going to be thinking about this? Am I always going to be battling this and wrestling this? Am I always going to be trying to excuse this? Am I always going to be trying to cover this up? Am I always going to be trying to get over this? If I become a believer, I put my hope and trust in Jesus, will my life really change? If I become a believer, how do I stop doing the old me things? I know I'm supposed to be the new me, but how do I stop doing the old me things? Since I've become a believer, why haven't I really changed? Can I really wait God out to be zapped in deliverance or zapped into freedom or zapped into healing? So, here's the solution. The solution, by the way, is very complex and takes a lifelong to solve, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the, the starting point today, okay? It's a starting point. And the starting point is this, that even though you may have been damaged by your past or distorted, it does not, it cannot, and it should not define you, especially if you know the living God of the universe through the Bible that has been revealed to us in the, in the express image of who Jesus is. Here's what you can count on. God makes it possible for you to change. God makes it possible for you to change. And I don't mind one bit if you see something, read something, or hear something that you agree with if you said, yes, that's true. That, I mean, whatever word comes to you, let it fly. I don't, mind, I don't need you to do that, but you have permission to do that. Check this out. You are not stuck in the old life before meeting and knowing who Jesus was. Now, maybe, maybe, this, maybe this is the appropriate question. How many of you have actually experienced a life change since coming to saving faith with Jesus. Anybody look around and see these hands. These are people whose lives have been transformed by Jesus, through Jesus, and they discovered firsthand it's possible to change. You don't have to stay dented and damaged and otherwise completely distorted in who you are and what your identity is being in the process of transformation, and that's a Bible word, transformation, being transformed. God's story in Ephesians starts like this. God says in Ephesians, I sent Jesus. He has the miraculous role and responsibility of unifying all creation under his authority and under his leadership, and he's reconciled insiders and outsiders, and he's made one new family with them, and he is going to continue to reconcile and renew them into new living, and then, therefore, because of that, God's story now changes your story. Your story gets changed by God's story. So, now we pick up in Ephesians chapter 4, and here's how we start. Halfway through, we're in verse 17, God says through Paul, writing to the Ephesian church, Live no longer as the Gentiles do. Okay, so you are one new family, and you are able to change, and he says, don't live the way you used to live. Don't live the way that the Gentiles do. And he makes this proposition to every believer. You can experience a new way to be human. How do you do that? Renounce your old life. Replace the old life with your new life. And then simply let the Spirit continue to renew you. Three-ish phases of this life change. So what do you do first? Well, you renounce your old life. If you are in the Ephesian church, you're receiving this letter, you're saying, I, my hope just came alive with Jesus. First time, uh, uh, my hope has come alive in Jesus. I used to trust in other gods. I used to trust in the rules and so on. But now my hope has come alive in Jesus. And Paul says, don't live the way that the Gentiles live. You no longer live that way. You're able to renounce that old life. You consider your old life, you think about your old life, and you renounce your old life. That old life is the old bundle of thoughts and attitudes and emotions and um, even the practices that you used to have. And you say, that didn't work. 
Anyone ever tell you what they're about to do and you realize it's the same thing they've always done, but this time they're really going to do it and you start to think to yourself, how's that working for you? How? That's a great question. If you ever get a chance to uh, um, ask that question, drop it on somebody now and then and, um, and then just sit back and listen. How's that been working for you? And for a lot of us, we continue to do, and isn't it, isn't it, that's that little cliche definition of insanity, right? Do the same things you've always done and then expect a different result. That's like, that's the idea. We used to do these things, have these emotions and these practices and these attitudes and these thoughts, and we're going to continue to live like that and expect something to change. Well, what can I do? with that old bundle? What do I do with the former way of life? Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Throw it off. There is an action, right? You don't take action to save yourself. God does this miraculous work on the inside, but then you have some effort to put in to see some movement in your spiritual maturity with God's help. So what Paul's saying here is no more Christian chameleons. No more blending in and looking like all the godless folks called the Gentiles who submitted themselves and and basically worshipped their own uh, gods and their own appetites. So we've been delivered, and we know this, we've been delivered from the punishment of sin. When you come to saving faith in Jesus, you're delivered from the punishment of sin. And you're delivered from the power of sin over you, the bondage that you have to sin. But we're not yet delivered from the presence of sin. And that means that we're always going to be battling and we're always going to be wrestling through. And as long as sin is present with us, it can make life more painful, it can make our life more difficult. But there's signs and symptoms of this old life, and Paul details them here for us. There's signs and symptoms of our sinful nature, that old way of life, the Gentiles' former way of godless living. And here it is. They are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life of God, the, the, the life that God gives because they've closed their minds and they've hardened their hearts against Him. And for those of you who are observing our culture sometimes, observing our political landscape sometimes, it really shouldn't surprise us when we think about somebody who does not yet know Jesus and this is the kind of life we see. These are the kind of symptoms we see. But Paul is saying here, these are symptoms of the old life. The Gentiles who are without Jesus continue to live like this. But once you've come to saving faith, you know who Jesus is, you've rested your hope and trust in him, then there is this new life that we are recognizing with those symptoms. By the way, he goes on, that's not it. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure. They eagerly practice every kind of impurity. So, we're all battling this corruptive nature and this corrupted nature, this disorder called the sinful nature. Uh, So he says, your old sinful nature in your former way of life. We're back to verse 17, uh, verse 22 here. Your old sinful nature in your former way of life. By the way, there is a word here that you have to grasp, and it is the word nature, which of course comes from the word, help me out, natural. Thank you, English teacher. Sinful nature, right? It is natural sinfulness that um, we have in our bodies or otherwise called the flesh. And this started with Adam. Adam is an easy target but also an accurate target. Adam all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And Adam back in the Garden of Eden is where original sin came from. And humans are born with the seed of Adam. They inherently naturally sin. They inherently adopt that seed, that uh, corrupt, sinful nature. And the fall means, the fall of Adam simply means this, that all of us are corrupted by the natural orientation to live our lives for ourselves and about ourselves, right? Which is basically means to live for our own glory. We're expanding our own image, our own desires, our own needs and wants, we kind of see our life through this orientation towards self-centeredness, that would be a sinful nature. Elevating the self, and you remember Adam and Eve did that, right? The the serpent tempts them and they elevate their own uh, glory over God's glory after some deceitful questions. Uh, So it's a default position, our sinful nature. 
And that nature is more desirable for human beings because of the flesh or the orientation for living for the self. So what, is, what should we know about the sinful nature? It's corrupted by lust and deception. Corrupted by lust. Well, what does that mean? Um, there isn't just a physical sexual lust. There's a lot of different ways lust can be defined, right? In fact, in, in the, I think it's the book of 1 John, he describes how there is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, um, pride of life. So this lust means a strong desire or an urge or an appetite for something you're not entitled to. More of something good or more of something that you can have, but uh, perhaps more than you're entitled to. It's an appetite, an urge, or a desire, and it's strong. And these lusts drag us around for most of our lifetime, pursuing things that we want or need. And it's also corrupted by deception. Deception, of course, has an element of truth, but then that truth is distorted, and oftentimes it's the only real weapon of the enemy who's called in the Scriptures the devil uh, over us is to distort the truth. Or I like to use this word, to counterfeit the truth. And we see this also happen in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Something false that's distorted and it makes it believable, right? I'll give you an example. Just think of any and every infomercial you've ever seen. You watch that infomercial and in two minutes, the first, this is what happens to me. The first 30 seconds, I'm like, there's no way. That is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I don't need a clip for my chips. I don't need it. Two minutes in, I'm like, how have I ever lived one day without a clip for my chips. How is that even possible? How did my parents not tell me about the chip clip? And then they do this extraordinarily uncomfortable, awkward, and dramatized before, right? And then the bag of chips, they're like pouring it on top of themselves, like, oh, before this chip clip, don't you remember when you would inadvertently, accidentally, just kind of randomly pour the chips all over the front of yourself. And by the end of the infomercial, infomercial, you've ordered one. But wait, there's more. You don't just get one, you get two, or maybe five, or 18 for your friends and family. So they all know you shop QVC. The, the, uh, then, I don't need to tell you, in fact, I have a friend of mine who um, told me that um, I was asking about this, I don't remember what it was, some product or whatever. He goes, I have it. I said, you do? He said, yeah. In fact, I have all of it. I said, what do you mean all of it? He said, anything you've ever seen on TV related to fitness. I said, what? He said, yeah. My basement, I have all the things. All the things that are sold on the infomercial related to fitness, I own it. I said, are any of them out of the box? And he said, not really. (laughs) Not really. Here is... Here is, don't judge them, because we might have, we probably have one or so of something somewhere that has come, right? And when we saw the infomercial, we were like, that's so true. Then you get it and you realize it's true but distorted. It's not that true. It's not true enough that I should have spent my money on it. And so the power that the enemy has with our sinful nature is to take something true, which is typically something we desire, want, or need, and then it's distorted, and it's distorted to feed ourselves this lie. And the lie is the deception. The lie is what's underneath every sin. Because every behavior has an underlying motive driving that behavior, which we call heart sin. It's the sin under the surface, and it's the lie that's told to get us there. I'll give you an example of one. Satisfying this desire, this is a part of what we think, and and maybe even when we're watching the infomercials, this is what we think. Satisfying this desire, urge, or appetite will be gratifying. That's a part of it. But there's actually um, a lie underneath our lust, our lust that comes through Uh, that is corrupting our sinful nature, and here's what it is. This is even more specific. If I can just get, or if I can just have what it is I want this particular time, or even maybe what it is I need, it'll be more satisfying. I will be more fulfilled and more gratified. And without saying it, what we're saying is it'll be more satisfying than the glory of God that's expressed in Jesus that's supposed to completely satisfy all our desires, all of our needs, all of our wants. 
but we have to be convinced by the deception that's going on and the corruption of our flesh. We have to be deceived to believe that whatever it is that we're urged to have or that we need or that we want is somehow going to be more gratifying than anything God has ever provided to us through Jesus. And that leads us into this sinful nature, following our sinful nature. And what Paul is saying here is we have to recognize this distortion and this corruption And we have to renounce it and say, that life is something that's behind me. I'm passing on that. I now renounce that life. I don't want it and I don't need it. And what's so dangerous about this disease in the former way of life is that this kind of like this this supernatural creator of the universe comes and delivers us this news that the sinful nature has, in fact, it's a terminal illness punishable by death and separation from God. And there's only one treatment. Since we can't do surgery on our own souls, there's only one treatment. And here's what it is. We start with Jesus. That seems so obvious if you're a Christian, you start with Jesus. But we start with so many other things. We start so many other places. We, um, you know, we, we, we even think, for a lot of times we think, all right, I am sick of this old life I've been living. I've been trapped, stuck. I'm, I'm tired of the way things are going. So now it's time to turn over. What do we turn over? A new leaf. Or we might say it's time for a new outlook. Who said I need a new attitude? Who sang that? Aretha? Is that right? No? I need a new focus. And, and, and one of the traps with a new focus is I need to focus on myself, right? And a lot of times um, I think someone means they've been getting stepped on and abused and now they're not going to let that happen, happen anymore. But other times people mean I need to focus on myself and they believe that what I need to overcome and what I need for healing and what I need for wholeness I'm going to find in myself. And yet the Scriptures teach us that the reason that we got where we got was because of what we find inside. Selfishness, pride, so on. So, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, Paul says, renounce your old life, and since you've learned about Jesus, that's where we're starting. Since you have learned about Jesus, since you've learned the truth that comes from him, you discovered that following the rules doesn't change your life. And the Israel, Israel the, 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 the Jewish people in the Pharisee um, community had been devoted to pleasing God and winning his approval by following his law. And then Paul comes with this good news of the gospel and says, it's not, a, it's not rules that change your life. It's a relationship with God through Jesus. It's a new heart. You're not rescued with new Christian rules. Your life doesn't change just by... Um, refocusing and redevoting yourself to new rules. God is not trying to change our heart here in the book of Ephesians by saying, be more religious, be more righteous. In fact, when we learn the good news about Jesus and put our faith in Jesus, He doesn't give us new rules, He gives us a new heart. And when we get a new heart, we get a new start. It's called regeneration. Regeneration is the way that it happens, and it comes through repentance, and our new nature is regenerated with a new heart. Well, how do we know that? Well, let me take you back 600 years when Ezekiel, the prophet, is giving a message to the Jews who are completely hung up on appeasing God through the law. And, and, and um, in fact, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel tells the Israelite people that there's going to be a day when God is going to go do some serious surgery, and he's going to fix the relationship with his people, and he's not going to fix it with 10 more commandments. He's not going to fix it with 100 more commandments. He's not going to fix it with new morality. Instead, he says, I'm going to fix it by giving you a new heart. How does it go? He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take out of you the heart of stone, and I'll replace it with a heart of flesh. And you will sense that I'm near. You will sense that I love you. You will sense me calling you to saving faith. And then after you have your new heart, the Spirit will help you to be obedient. Because stone hearts, hard hearts are not obedient. They're stiff-necked, proud, self-righteous, and self-reliant. So he has radically, Jesus has radically changed our hearts. And to the degree in which we are 
in union with him, we see disobedience get replaced with obedience. We become fully capable, right? We're fully alive to God and fully capable of obedience. How does that happen? Through our union with Jesus, through the Spirit making our hearts alive to God for the first time ever. We're dead to sin and alive to God. It's impossible except that God has given us a new heart. I'm defined by this new identity, new desires, new attitudes. So I want you to picture this, right? So picture this, if you would, with me using this idea of transformation. And to think of transformation, I have this um, kind of this progression for you. And this is so helpful when you think of your movement in your spiritual maturity of renouncing the old life, starting with Jesus, and then beginning to grow in your faith. You could think of yourself as starting over there. Some people say caterpillar at the end. I think it's so much more hard-hitting and dramatic to say worm. Start with the worm, and then at the end of the transformation, we get this beautiful butterfly. But most of us who have come to saving faith in Jesus, He has regenerated our hearts, we are somewhere in this process of transformation, but one of the key parts of this transformation is to shed the old skin. One of the cool parts of the butterfly, I mean, I don't know if you're as horrified as I am, what if this butterfly just took the skin with it and floated around, and it would be far less beautiful. Do you agree if it was floating around carrying its old dead skin? It's not quite the impact, not quite the beauty. Not quite the beauty. I don't know if I want it landing on me. I don't know if I want it landing on me anyway, but with the old dead skin. So there's a shedding that goes on by this butterfly at some point where it lives free and it lives new and it finds itself living a new life. But most of us are in this process somewhere where we are learning to shed the old life, to throw it off, to see ourselves as having a new heart in union with Jesus. We're alive to God and alive to obedience and a desire to obey. And we are now so alive to God through His Spirit who dwells in us, we get to replace the old nature with our new one. Replace the old nature with your new one. And this is so important. If you have not been able to keep up or stay on track until this point, now is the time to take that on-ramp back on and, and lock into this to learn. Check this out. This is so vital that we get this. Put on your new nature created to be, not the best version of your grandparents or your spiritual parents or your spiritual leaders at your church. You have been given this new nature, which was created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So you have a new heart that brings a new natural, a new natural, new freedoms, new affections, a new will, and a new power to live a new life, all provided on the inside. And there's this word that's important. It's called liberty. Paul the Apostle writes about Christian liberty over and over and over. What does that mean? Freedom from the old law. Freedom, not freedom to obey, but freedom to win God's approval and favor through obedience to the law. We get to say no to temptation. Well, how do we say yes to some? Uh, how do we say no to something? And here's how. And we've mentioned this a few times in some of these series, but I want, to, I want you to try to grasp this again. We say no to the old. This is so important. This could be life changing. This could be life changing. We say no to the old by saying yes to what? Yes, that's it. We say no to the old. How? By saying yes to the new. One Puritan wrote about it this way, Thomas Chalmers. He's, he called it the expulsive power of a new affection. Some of us have experienced this actually happening in our lives inadvertently. And I can give you an example. I remember asking a family member of, my, of mine one time who I hadn't seen in a long time. I found out whether he said it or he mentioned it or someone else did that he quit smoking. And I said to him, um, wow, is it true? Did I hear, are you telling me that you quit smoking? And, and, and he said, yes. And I gained 50 pounds doing it. What happened? No to smoking, yes to overeating. Right? In other words, I displaced that old stinky habit of mine that I had with a new life-altering, put-me-in-my-grave-too-soon habit. 
So life change, this is so important, life change is not saying no to bad things. How many of you grew up and the main message that you absorbed from your faith was saying no to bad things? Anybody? No to bad things. No, no, no to bad stuff. Is that important? Yes. Paul already said so. Throw off your old stuff. Throw it off. But that's not it. It's not where we stop. That's not what we hope in. That's not what we're telling people about. Oh my goodness, I want to tell you something so critical. This will change your life. You, like me, could spend the rest of your life saying no to all the good stuff, on, uh, all the things that you want the rest of your life. No thanks. Not appealing. But what we're saying is this, that we have a new nature. It's created in God to be like God. And what we have to offer you is so terrific, you'll throw off the old and you get to replace it with the new. And you find yourself growing in new affection and the old affection begins to kind of wither and fade. And I've used this analogy before. I was not able to give up fast food until after I got married and my wife started to cook real food. I couldn't, get rid of, I couldn't get rid of old fake desserts and I, until I started to have homemade real desserts. And then I could drive by those Wendy, Wendy's billboards on the highway and, so, and, and curse them and saying, get behind me, Satan. Just kidding. Because I'm on my way home to eat real food. I'm going to have real dessert, and I could say no to the fake, and I could say no to the counterfeit because I've experienced the real thing. And God is helping the Ephesians discover that your life following me and serving Jesus is not going to be a life that's 100% devoted to saying no and throwing off. It's going to be replaced with a new joy, a new affection for God, and an entirely new kind of inner peace, and you say yes to that and no to the old the expulsive power of a new affection. When your heart loves something, it does something. When your heart loves something, it, it moves things around to make it happen. It's amazing to me. When I have something I want to buy or find, it's amazing to me how far... This happens on Facebook Marketplace before it turned into like a digital flea market. I would find something I've been looking for, I'd find something at the right price, and I would find something that I des decided that I absolutely had to have, and no matter what the inconveniences were, no matter how far, no matter how much, no matter what got in the way, I would find a way to get all the way there in the most inconvenient times of my life, because I had to have it. And then two hours later, look at my watch and say, ah, I've only got an hour to get to the gym. I think it's too, my, my, my schedule's too jammed up. Can't do it. In other words, I don't really want to do that. So every little excuse I could find, oh, the traffic is so heavy, I'm probably not going to make it to the gym today. What's that mean? It means that our hearts follow stuff that we want. We get things. We have time. We, have, uh, um, we, we put in our lives the things that we have affection for. So, what if you can't say no? If you can't say no to the stuff that we're trying to throw off, I wouldn't, if I were you, I wouldn't focus on getting better at saying no. I would focus on a renewed vision of how beautiful and how fulfilling Jesus is. That's where I would start. A clearer picture, a clearer vision of the beauty of Jesus. So, you're putting on your new nature created to be like God. Believers who are in Christ have a new freedom to choose. We get to choose that truth is better than lies. It's certainly less chaotic and less dramatic, right, to be people of the truth. We get to choose that righteous anger is better than sinful anger. That hard work is better than stealing and cutting corners. We get the freedom to choose, according to chapter 4 in Ephesians, that wholesome talk is better and should, be, and should replace rotten words and rotten talk. And compassion replaces bitterness. And there's a word picture worth thinking about here. When you come to belong to Jesus, think of it like getting a gym membership. You're part of his family. But to see positive results, you can't leave the gym membership as a keychain and never actually use it at the gym. I know that's probably hitting too close to home for many of us. You, in order to see positive changes you expect, that has to be put into place. And it's our responsibility to believe these truths. It's our responsibility to rejoice in these truths and then live in the reality of them as well. Lastly, let the Spirit 
renew you. Let the Spirit renew you. You remember getting your driver's license, some of you? You remember getting your driver's license? And you remember how the day that you got your driver's license, you became an expert driver? It doesn't work like that, does it? When you get your driver's license, all it means is it's recognized, you are recognized now to have the minimum proficiency to get behind the wheel and not get ticketed for not having your license or to drive illegally. So a driver's license means you're able to drive. But haven't you decided or, or discovered that it never meant that at 16 years old you know everything that you need to know about effective driving? What happens? You get your license at 16, and then for the rest of your life, you're going to learn how to be a completely uh, finished expert driver. It requires a lifetime of learning. And when you believe, when you put your trust in Jesus, and your heart is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. So you basically get a faith license. You're a part of the faith family. And then you spend the rest of your life learning how to let the Spirit renew you. It's a lifelong spiritual maturity. It requires a lifetime of learning. To learn how to avoid all the deadly and dangerous obstacles that are in the way. Here's what Paul says about it. He says, Live earlier, live no longer as the Gentiles do. Instead, here's the next part, the power part, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. So we can't just renounce our old life, start with Jesus, and then replace it with the new. That's, we're not doing that on our own. We're letting the Spirit do that. And this is how God, by His Spirit, renews you. He renews your thoughts and He renews your attitudes. And in this passage, God promises two things to radically change our hearts, and then to actually put His Holy Spirit on the inner life called the indwelling of the Spirit, and He prompts us and He enables us to obey Him. So we're doing that because He's given us the power to do that. And our new heart, by the power of His indwelling Spirit, allows us to listen and yield. We listen and yield. We treasure Jesus above all else. How do we do that? The Spirit's at work. Every thought that we have is ca held captive and it's kind of vetted for the truth. Why are we doing that? Because the Holy Spirit is renewing us. Truth is desired and enjoyed over lies. Let me give you an example of how this works, if I could. Um, I want to um, give you this phrase here that's so important for us to recognize because our spiritual life is very similar to our physical life. And here's a principle that you'll notice uh, works for both. What you feed grows and what you starve dies. Don't be surprised if the thing that is overtaking your life is being fed. Don't be surprised if the thing that's dying off in your life is being starved. And it's so vital. But when we're talking about your attitudes or we're talking about your thoughts, I want to I show you something called the four G's of life change. And the four G's of life change, you can read about yourself in a book called You Can Change. Tim Chester wrote it, one of my favorite books. It's a book on spiritual transformation. How do people change? If you're stuck, how do you get unstuck, and how do you grow in your faith and mature and make, your, make progress? I'd recommend this book. He talks about four Gs, and here's how it goes. It starts with understanding um, some of these, having these, the right thoughts. If you truly believe God is good, okay? So let me give you four Gs that is, um, kind of appeals to our thinking. Number one, God is good, gracious, Great, and there's another one, glorious. Glorious. Good, great, glorious, darn it. Why did I start it again? Good, great, glorious, and gracious. You got it. You got it. Okay, so can I show you how this works? The truth is you come to think in your mind, God is good. God is good. Would you agree that's thrown around pretty good? That's thrown around a lot, right? God is good. You know, for a lot of people, that's hard to believe. Hardship, grief, disappointment. Sometimes it feels like, okay, is God, you know, did I do something terrible because my life is completely, um, um, this is full of hardship and hurt and heartache and so on. But so here's my thinking. God is good. So I think that the Holy Spirit reminds me that's true. God is good. That's a thought you should kind of hold on to. Now, your attitude also gets renewed by the Spirit. And what that means is this. This, if this is true in my thinking, 
then this is true in my attitude. If, it, if I truly believe that God is good, then I don't have to look for my comfort in other things because that which is most good is God. I don't have to turn to other things called functional saviors to find my comfort. Does that make sense? But I only, I only do that I only make that change if I believe that God is good. And when I'm turning to other things for my comfort, it's indicative, it's a sign and symptom that I know God is good, but I don't really believe God is good. Does that make sense? So in other words, I'm living with this attitude that is in contrast with my thinking or my thought. Let me give you another example. Some of these, you've got all four Gs, but I'll put them up here to remind you. If I truly believe that God is great... I believe this. I thought of this. I've studied this. I've come across God in the Scripture, and I believe He is great. He he has created the universe. He is at work drawing men, women, and young people to Himself. God is redeeming bad things that happen in my life, circumstances that blow up, incidents and accidents that hurt me and hurt other people. God's at work. He's healing and he's at work restoring and redeeming. If that is true, if God is great, then here's what it means, that my attitude changes. I don't have to manipulate people or control them. Why don't I? Because God is great and God is able. And now, now some of you parents... This is huge. This is huge. Here we are, dedicating little ones. We're entrusting their lives to the creator of the universe. And somehow, when it gets scary, somehow when they're off on their own, sometimes when we look at how big, bad, and ugly our world is, we are compelled or prompted to start to manipulate them or control their circumstances. I don't mean make wise choices, right? I don't mean just make wise choices. There are wise places to go and be, and there's not wise places to go and be. There's wise people to be around, and it's unwise to be around. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a level inside our heart where we're manipulating and controlling circumstances. And so here's where I would start. I wouldn't start by trying to modify behavior and say you shouldn't do that. Let's go back even further and say, do we believe this? Do we believe that God is great and he's at work divinely redeeming and reconciling and he is um, drawing our own kids to himself even though at the time they're sitting in the proverbial pig pen, and we're praying, God, would you do something to get them out? But if you're not going to do it, I am. I'm going to do it. I'm going to control the people around them. I'm going to manipulate all the circumstances. Meanwhile, it's only the Spirit of God that can bring the prodigal child to their senses. It doesn't mean there aren't moments in time where we're intervening and we're uh, um, preventing an emergency or a tragedy, but... I'm just curious, parents, parents, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? At some point or other, our parenting comes to the edge of the fence, and then we look over and say, God, they're yours. They're yours. You and only you could actually bring this heart to full repentance, and I believe you're great. If you created the universe, you could certainly pursue and bring to saving faith my child, my grandchild, or my child. And so I'm going to trust that you're going to do your thing. And the reason I'm able to do that, the reason I'm able to take my hands off of the control and stop manipulating people or them is because I believe you're great. Next one. If I truly believe God is glorious, I don't have to fear others. I like to put it this way. If God is glorious, why would I care what anyone else thinks of me? Why would I? I I have no reason to care what someone else thinks of me if I primarily, exclusively care what God thinks. And if He is so glorious, so supremely valuable, if He is so uh, um, supremely bright, and His what He thinks and what He does and who He is is so supremely weighty, I have to concern myself only with Him and I don't have to fear other people. Because other people compared to Him just don't compare. So, last one. If I truly believe God is gracious, 
I don't have to prove myself or pretend I'm someone else. Why? Because God receives me as I am. I don't have to fake it to make it with him. I don't have to pretend I'm someone I'm not to other people because I know that though other people might reject me for who I am and my failures and my flaws, I know that God is gracious. So I don't have to pretend. I don't have to pose. I don't have to prove myself and tell everybody all the things I'm achieving and accomplishing, all the progress I've made. I get to let that be something that I revel in with God because I know that He's gracious and He has done the work to say, I'm going to receive you as you are, and I'm going to give you grace. So we have to remember, we belong to God. You belong to God. He's identified you as his own, and he's guaranteed that we will be saved. We will be saved from the punishment for sin. We will be saved from the power of sin. And one day, finally, in eternity, we'll be saved from the presence of sin after we're glorified with the Father in heaven. And our new nature frees us to bear God's image. Our new nature um, helps us. Well, how do we possibly do that? We replace um, willpower with God's power. One of the traps here is that we're going to do all of this life change with our own willpower, right? Uh, Maybe it comes through more information. I start to think, if I know it, then I can do it. Or maybe it's more motivation, which is simply the belief that I can do that. I just need more motivation, the the belief that I can do it, or more inspiration, which is if he, she, or they can do it, I can do it. And what we're seeing here is that this is something, this is a change that happens by God himself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for life change. We pray that here in Ephesians chapter 4, that this truth would come alive in our hearts and that you'd begin to help us move towards life change. I pray that you'd Help this truth to come alive in our hearts. That someone here today would sense for the very first time, it is time to put their faith, to rest their confident trust in Jesus' work. And not their own effort to follow the rules, not their own effort to live more righteously, but to just come to surrender their heart to Jesus and then see and savor the way that Jesus appears more beautiful to them and brings change, new affection, new desires, new attitudes, new thoughts that are renewed by the Spirit. We thank you for doing that today. God, I pray for our church family, whether it's somebody who is watching live stream or here with us present, I pray God, that your spirit would be alive to bring the renouncing of the old, that they would come alive to Jesus, that they would replace their old life with something brand new, and they would sense and allow your spirit to bring this newness. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen.